You know what's awkward? It's awkward when you're trying to get the country of Jordan to give you a really big contract and to make yourself seem like an attractive candidate for that contract, you decide you're going to give the king of Jordan five machine guns. Now, I should clarify, uh, that isn't actually the awkward part. That's a normal part of your business day. Mr. King, sir, oh, this is not a bribe. This is a gift, a gift of five machine guns, because we like you so much. Uh, that, in and of itself, not awkward. What's awkward about giving the five machine guns to the King of Jordan is when you realize that you're really not supposed to own those guns at all, legally. And now you've got to concoct some cockamamie story explaining where those guns went. The cockamamie story explaining what happened to the five machine guns they gave to the King of Jordan allegedly involved falsifying four federal documents. That charge is part of a multi-count indictment handed down today against former employees of Blackwater, the former president of Blackwater and four former Blackwater employees. They're charged variously with conspiracy to violate firearms laws, possession of a machine gun, possession of an unregistered weapon, false statements, and obstruction of justice. They are also charged with using a local sheriff's department in North Carolina, using that sheriff's department's letterhead to make it look like the sheriff was buying machine guns when the machine guns were really for Blackwater. This is just the latest in a series of charges against Blackwater and its employees. In 2008, the State Department charged the company with shipping 900 weapons into Iraq without the proper permits. Many of those weapons ended up on the black market. In the same year, five Blackwater employees were indicted on manslaughter and weapons charges after 17 Iraqis were killed in Baghdad's Nisur Square. Those charges were later dropped because of prosecutorial misconduct. And this year, the Justice Department is investigating whether Blackwater officials tried to bribe members of the Iraqi government in order to keep their security contract in Iraq after the Nassour Square shooting. But despite that delightful history, um, Blackwater is still reportedly in the running for lucrative government contracts, potentially including the $1 billion Pentagon contract to train the Afghan police. That is a task that America has been funding and supposedly working on for over eight years now. Since 2003, that task has been contracted out to a company called DynCorp. Now, what has that yielded? Six billion dollars and eight years later? It's yielded an Afghan police force that is so shambolic and poorly trained, they quite literally cannot shoot straight. As reported recently in Newsweek, quote, at Kabul's police training center, a team of 35 Italian carabinieri recently arrived to supplement DynCorp's efforts. Before the Italians showed up, the recruits were posting miserable scores on the firing range. But the Italians soon discovered that poor marksmanship wasn't the only reason. The sights of the AK-47 and M-16 rifles the recruits were using were badly out of line. Quote, we zeroed all their weapons, said Lieutenant Rolando Tomasini. It's a very important thing, but no one had done this in the past. I don't know why. I know, I know. That story prompted our next guest at an oversight hearing in the Senate to say, quote, we're paying somebody to teach these people to shoot these weapons and nobody ever bothered to check their sights? Joining us now after way too long an absence is Senator Claire McCaskill of the great state of Missouri, chair of the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Contracting. Senator, thank you so much for your time tonight. Good to see you. Thanks, Rachel. Good to be with you. After all of these years and all of these billions paid to contractors to do this, do they have any explanation for why they haven't done something as simple as, as telling people what the sights on their guns are for? Well, frankly, I mean, it's been like the Wild West because nobody's been watching them. This is a textbook example of complete lack of oversight on contracting. And it wouldn't be so frustrating if this wasn't a story that we've heard over and over again. If you look at this contract, it's been bounced around from uh, defense to state. Uh, now they're trying to take it back to defense. And here's the saddest part of the story. This is a key mission of what we're doing in Afghanistan. Training these police departments is one leg of a three-legged stool that is going to dictate whether or not we succeed or whether we fail. So contracting oversight on this police training mission is incredibly important and it has been an abject failure. General William Caldwell is in charge of training Afghan forces. He says publicly that he would rather work with people like the real Italian police or any real police other than working with contractors. Uh, General McChrystal today said that we're too reliant on contractors. He said they don't save money. He says he wants fewer of them in Afghanistan. 
Who is actually in favor of these contractors still being there? Why can't we seem to free ourselves of them? Well, it's, it's because we didn't have enough people when we went into Iraq. Truth be known, we didn't have the size of force necessary to do what we were trying to do in Iraq. So the logistic support went to contractors. The um, training of police went to contractors. Now we're repeating that in Afghanistan. Now, hopefully, uh, I was in Afghanistan not too long ago, met with both General McChrystal and General Caldwell. I will tell you, General Caldwell gets it. He understands how badly this has been done before. He understands that he's got to get this under his command and get control of it. But just to give you another example of what, what nonsense there is here, guess who they're hiring to oversee the contractors that are training the police in Afghanistan? Contractors. <laughs> so we've got to get people in the country that work for our military, that are watching the way these people are being trained, because it's not just training, it's also mentoring. There's rampant corruption in these police departments. Uh, and you're not going to establish a rule of law unless you work on the mentoring part so they realize there's a different way to police besides saying, what can you pay me to let you go? I worry about the oversight of, of contracts themselves being uh, contracted out, contractors overseeing contractors. I also worry about the fact that we think this is something that can only be done by contractors in terms of develop, uh, delivering this, this service. I mean, Blackwater is up for this police training contract in Afghanistan now, despite Nassour, uh, Nassour Square, despite the State Department investigations, despite this indictment against their former employees. I mean, how badly does a company have to behave before we stop? hiring them and just have our troops and our government employees do this stuff. Part of the problem is that our military wants what they want when they want it. And contracting is a quicker way to get there. Um, we've got to realize that that is a luxury we can no longer afford because it hasn't, hasn't been a good investment for our taxpayers and it hasn't been the kind of support our military needs. So we have to begin to realize that especially training local police for rule of law in a counterinsurgency effort, which is going to be a core competency of our military forever, we've got to bring that in-house. We've got to make sure we've got the, the oversight of the contracts that are in the military chain of command so we know who to fire when it goes badly. That's part of the problem with this mess, is you don't even know who to hold accountable because it's such a cluster. You've got NATO in there, you've got the military, you've got the State Department. Meanwhile, these contractors, they're not really sure who the boss is, so they do what they feel like. Do you feel like you have support in the administration and at the Pentagon for the views that you've expressed here and the way that you've approached this issue? I do. Um, you know, now, this is not something you can turn a switch and accomplish. Part of the problem, Rachel, is the area of contracting is not exactly sexy. And you might have noticed that folks around the Capitol kind of like the stuff that's getting the headlines that day. So part of it is an attention span. Um, that's why I'm happy about this committee. We can stay on this, even though there may not be a full hearing room, there may, may not be cameras or people covering it in the newspaper, but these agencies are going to know somebody is paying attention to the way they're contracting. And I think over time we're going to be able to make a real difference because nobody's been paying this kind of attention to contracting in the federal government before. You keep doing these hearings, and I promise we will keep covering it, at least in our little show here at 9 o'clock. Um, I have one last question for it's you, Senator. It's a deal. All right, it's a deal. Um, sure. One, uh, one last question is, and I know that you won't answer it directly, but I'm just going to ask anyway. Wouldn't being a Supreme Court justice be an awesome job? Honestly, not for me. <laughs> I would get way too restless. Um, you know, I, I, I love, I'm an intellectually curious person, and I do love to read, but it's an isolating job, and I kind of need to be out there mixing it up a little bit more than you can do as a Supreme Court justice. So it's not something that I, honestly, I don't think I'd even be considered, uh, but if I were, I'd have to say I, I don't think I'm the right personality to be a Supreme Court justice. Senator Claire McCaskill of the great state of Missouri, answering that with way more detail than I ever thought I'd get. Uh, thank you so much for your time, today, man, and, and, and good luck to the Cardinals tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right.